All right, welcome back to part two of the discussion on acute pancreatitis. I am Dr. Linda Chu, an associate professor of radiology at Johns Hopkins. So in the previous talk, we went over the reviews the revised Atlanta classification for acute pancreatitis. And within this session, we're gonna talk more about the complications. So we'll talk about infection, GI complications, disconnected pancreatic duct and vascular complications. So necrotic pancreatic collections are more likely to become infected as opposed to just the edematous fluid collections. And infection is rare within the first week. Clinically, the patients will present with sepsis. And on CT, one of our biggest clue is if we see air within the fluid collection. So this is an example of a patient who had necrotizing pancreatitis two months ago. He came in with 17% bands in his blood work. And here we see a very necrotic peripancreatic fluid collection with very heterogeneous fluid and soft tissue components, and also we see a lot of air within this collection. So in the absence of any previous instrumentation, we would strongly suspect infection as the culprit for this. Recently, the AGA published guidelines for management of necrotizing pancreatitis, and they suggest that we reserve anti antimicrobial therapy in patients who have culture-proven infection or strong clinical suspicion for infection. The routine prophylactic use is not recommended. And in patients who have sterile collections, they, res they recommend that we should avoid draining these early in the acute period and should delay them for at least four weeks so that they develop a more defined wall. Obviously, in patients who have infection, then they would go in and drain them earlier. In terms of drainage approaches, percutaneous drainage and transmural endoscopic drainage are both appropriate first-line non-surgical approaches in patients with Waldorf necrosis. Transmural drainage through the stomach may be preferred because it avoids the risk of a pancreatic cutaneous fistula. Percutaneous drainage should be strongly considered as an adjunct to endoscopic drainage for walled-off necrosis with deep extension into the pericolic gutters and pelvis. And if those more conservative approaches fail, then patients may need to undergo endoscopic necrosectomy or surgical debridement. Here are just some examples of patients who had walled on necrosis. You see this very heterogeneous collection adjacent to the pancreatic tail. And here they put in a percutaneous pigtail drain to manage the collection. And this is an example of transmural endoscopic drainage in which you have this large acute necrotic collection. The patient had severe symptoms so that they needed to go in. And they, here they put in a cisgastrostomy, uh, which you make this artificial connection between the stomach and the fluid collection to, to decompress this fluid collection through the stomach. This is a patient who, another patient who underwent a similar procedure in which you can see the cisgastrostomy stent between the stomach and the fluid collection, but patient had persistent symptoms symptoms despite the transmural endoscopic drainage and had to go on to necrosectomy. So these are some p images after necrosectomy. So in the two months post-op, you see this just very ill-defined tissue at the site where they did the necrosectomy. And on the 14 months post-op, this area is basically totally scarred down that we don't really see much of any remaining pancreas at that site. And thinking about the local GI complications from acute pancreatitis, there, there are multiple complications. Patients may develop duodenitis, and that is due to the pancreatic enzymes being very erosive. Can, they can cause inflammatory reaction in the adjacent bowel wall. And all those inflammatory mediators may also cause paralytic ileus, and that's thought to be due to a viscerally mediated reflex within the superior mesenteric plexus.
All the fluid collections and inflammation associated with pancreatitis can cause mass effect and extrinsic compression of the bowel and cause mechanical obstruction. And they can also cause fistula due to direct erosion from pancreatic enzymes or intestinal necrosis secondary to vascular thrombosis. Here are just some examples of duodenitis and ileus. This is a patient with necrotizing pancreatitis. You can see on a coronal image, there's very poorly enhancing pancreas right there. And in the adjacent duodenal C loop, you see marked bowel wall thickening. And then more globally within the small bowel, you see diffuse air fluid distension throughout the small bowel consistent with ileus. And as I mentioned before, these fluid collections can also cause mechanical obstruction due to mass effect, such as this example here, a patient with a very large fluid collection and it's basically compressing the gastric outlet and patient came in with symptoms of gastric outlet obstruction. We can identify fistulas based on a soft tissue tract extending from the pancreas to the adjacent organ, and the presence of internal gas also suggests connections to stomach or bowel. So this is an example of a fistula patient who has necrotizing pancreatitis with some fluid collections adjacent to the pancreas, and here you see that there are air bubbles within this collection. So your differential diagnosis when you see air within this necrotic collection would be either superimposed infection or it may be spontaneously fistulizing with adjacent stomach or bowel. So on EUS, they saw that there was a small fistula communication between this collection and the gastric antrum. This is another example that you have patient with necrotizing pancreatitis and you still have this persistent fluid collection that's tracking to the splenic flexure of the colon. And you see that the splenic flexure, there's, uh, there's reactive bowel wall thickening and it looks tethered to this peripancreatic fluid collection. And when you see this kind of tethering, you may think about the potential of a fistula. So we raised that possibility and they injected a drain that the patient has and we can clearly show that there is an abnormal communication between the pancreatic fluid collection and the, and the colon. And they were able to embolize this tract and close off the fistula. Another complication with necrotizing pancreatitis is a disconnected pancreatic duct. And the necrosis of the pancreatic duct can result in disconnection of the main pancreatic duct. And because, and generally in this condition, we see necrosis of more than two centimeters worth of the pancreas, and it results in lack of ductal continuity between the viable secreting pancreatic tissue and the GI tract. This Diagnosis is best made on ERCP, in which they can prove that there is abnormal extravasation of contrast from the pancreatic duct. But I'll show you some examples on CT and MRI. So in this patient who had history of necrotizing pancreatitis two months after the symptoms, we can see that the on the MRCP image, we can see the pancreatic duct within the head and and then, but more distally within the body and tail, we really don't see the duct very well. And when we see these peripancreatic collections. And here we see the pancreatic duct and then just some collections. It is very hard to make the call of a disconnected pancreatic duct. They went on to ERCP and then this is when they injected and what they saw was this very irregular tubular collection, which they interpreted as the dilated pancreatic duct. So patient also underwent CT and we can see this peripancreatic fluid collection. And on CT, because we have limited ability to evaluate the pancreatic duct, it can be very difficult to, to, to see whether this collection is connected to the duct or not.
patient underwent repeat ERCP, and this time we can clearly show that there is the pancreatic duct here, and then there's abnormal extravasation of contrast material from the pancreatic duct, proving that there's a leak from the pancreatic duct. And this time around, knowing the ERCP findings is a lot easier to make the findings on both CT and MRI, in which we can see that there, there is this abnormal communication between the pancreatic duct, and then we see this defect and open communication with the peripancreatic fluid collection on both CT and MRI. And this is the same guy on MRCP, in which we can see the pancreatic duct, and then basically communication with this peripancreatic collection. There's no standardized treatment for this disconnected pancreatic duct. They can try conservative treatment, endoscopic transpapillary drainage, endoscopic transluminal drainage, and if those fail, they generally go on to surgical drainage, or they may have to undergo distal pancreatectomy. And vascular complications occur in 25% of patients with acute pancreatitis. So the pancreatic enzymes are very erosive, so they can erode into the adjacent vasculature and cause pseudoaneurysms and spontaneous hemorrhage. And due to the mass effect of the inflammatory changes in fluid collections, and also all the inflammation lead to venous stasis, those can lead to venous thrombosis. Here are some examples of pseudoaneurysms associated with pancreatitis. Here is a patient who had history of necrotizing pancreatitis. You see some necrotic collections here, walled off necrosis, and then, but here you see this abnormal contrast collection that sometimes these pseudoaneurysms can be very subtle. They're only a few millimeters big, and so you can appreciate them better on either 2D, coronal, or sagittal images, and even better yet on MIP images. They make the, these vascular pathologies stand out a little bit more. This is a different patient who had a history of acute and chronic pancreatitis, in which you see this abnormal pseudoaneurysm arising from the splenic artery. And again, you can see these on 3D images, in this case, a volume rendered image that you can see this pseudoaneurysm show up a little bit better than on the axial images. And all these erosive changes can also just spontaneously erode into vessels and cause hemorrhage. So this is a patient coming in with worsening abdominal pain and was found to have this large hematoma due to subtle erosion of the splenic artery. And another patient here came in with history of pancreatitis and acute worsening abdominal pain. Again, and you can see that there's this high density fluid collection next to the pancreas due to spontaneous hemorrhage. And all the mass effect can lead to venous thrombosis as shown in this example here. You have a very large peripancreatic fluid collection and all these vascular problems are best shown on these MIPS and the volume rendered images that you can see that this collection is basically sitting on the splenic vein and the splenic vein is occluded. And in some other examples, you can actually see partial thrombus within the portal vein as shown here with these filling defects within the portal vein. So in assessing severity of acute pancreatitis, there are a whole number of clinical scoring systems that they incorporate uh, patient presentation, their clinical symptoms, various lab values to predict who's going to do well and who's not going to do well. And on the imaging side, there's also CT scoring systems, which is the CT severity index and the modified CT severity index that aims to predict the severity of pancreatitis. The original CT severity index was developed in 1990, and you get different points for assessing the degree of pancreatic inflammation. You get anywhere from zero points for normal pancreas to up to four points for greater than or equal to two acute peripancreatic fluid collection.
and we also get points for the degree of pancreatic necrosis. The modified CT severity index developed in 2004 takes into account the pancreatic inflammation and pancreatic necrosis, but also gives points for extra pancreatic complications, including pleural effusions, ascites, vascular complications, parenchymal complications, and or GI involvement. And there are also a number of emerging technologies, such as radiomics and deep learning, that have been applied to predict disease severity in pancreatitis. So if you are not familiar with radiomics, radiomics converts the imaging data into high-dimensional mineable features, and it has potential to yield imaging biomarkers for disease classification and prognostication. And there's been a few papers applying radiomics in acute pancreatitis to predict the severity and to predict the complications related to acute pancreatitis. In this study, they took 259 patients with early acute pancreatitis, and they took the contrast-enhanced MRI for prediction of severity. And they found that their radiomics model outperformed the traditional clinical models or even a MRI-based severity index in prediction of who's going to get severe disease. In a different study, they took 41 percent. Uh, sorry, they in a different study, they took 41 patients with acute pancreatitis, and who underwent diffusion-weighted imaging MRI, and they looked at histogram-based methods of the the distribution of the voxel units, and they found this parameter kurtosis was predictive of patients who will develop complications. And there's a lot of work in applying deep learning to mine all the data we get from acute pancreatitis in predicting who's going to get severe disease. So deep learning uses training data and multiple layers of equations to develop a mathematical model that fits the data. So on the clinical side, the clinicians have used different lab values and clinical variables to predict disease severity, who's going to develop portal vein thrombosis, who's going to develop organ failure, length of stay, and survival. And a lot of these deep network-based approaches have outperformed logistic regression models or clinical scoring systems. On the imaging side, we haven't really applied deep learning much in in incorporating radiology data in those predictions. Only one study so far have incorporated both radiologic and laboratory data to generate the prediction. And even within this study, they had a radiologist review the, the CTs and then they scored the CT features rather than using the raw images themselves. So there's a lot of potential in applying these more advanced techniques of radiomics and deep learning in predicting complications and who's going to do well and, and or poorly in patients with acute pancreatitis. In conclusion, CT is, a valuable, is very valuable in management of patients with acute pancreatitis. It is helpful in detection of acute pancreatitis in patients with equivocal clinical presentation, and it is good in classifying in Interstitial edematous pancreatitis versus necrotizing pancreatitis is great in identifying local complications, and it can provide prognostic information and guide management. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.